All right, so uh, sorry for the little glitch there. My video uh, went out on me a little bit there. Um, so anyway, so back back to priority admissions here. The um, there's nothing to lose from applying early. Uh, it can really work to your advantage. So if you can kind of get your uh, act together early enough to apply to priority admissions, there's nothing to lose, and there might be some some good things to be gained. And then and then finally, you know, there's there are no restrictions on this. You can apply to uh, other colleges uh, as many as you want, and uh, you know, it, this again is all kind of working in your your favor. So one second here. All right, and here's some deadlines for priority admission. So uh, again, you see these are earlier than the, the kind of later, you know, the regular admission deadline. So ranging from early November to Arcadia, January 15th. Uh, and if you look at the notification dates, those are earlier than regular decision dates as well. Okay, moving on here, early decision. The dreaded early decision. This is, I think, one of the uh, one of the more difficult admission models to figure out if it's right for you or not because it has some restrictions. So let's go through these. So, first of all, you can only apply to one college under early decision. Uh, one, you know, under kind of an early decision plan. So, if you are interested in multiple schools and don't really know where you want to attend, this model is not for you. Uh, if you're admitted to a school that you apply to under early decision, you must attend. If you don't, you're going to forfeit uh, a deposit and your name can also be shared with other schools and it can cause all kinds of, of problems for you. Uh, so you really want to be sure that you want to go to the college that you apply to early, under early decision. Uh, once you're admitted. So if you apply early decision, you can apply to other colleges under regular decision, but if you're admitted to your early decision school, you need to write to all those other colleges and withdraw your application. So, uh, you know, again, you're not limited to the number of schools you can apply to under regular admission, but if you're admitted early decision, you're, you're going to go to that college. Uh, it has some perks. Uh, all the statistics kind of show that students who apply under early decision have a much higher, sometimes not much higher, but so, sometimes a, a slightly higher to uh, a significantly higher acceptance rate. So your chances of getting in are better applying under early decision. And finally, uh, this is kind of down the road, but when you apply early decision and you're admitted, you don't have much leverage to negotiate financial aid because you're going to only have a financial aid package from that one school. So you won't be able to compare financial aid packages. You won't be able to see if the school can match an offer you got from another school uh, because you really just have that one financial aid package. So pros and cons to this. Um, we'll, we'll look at some of the statistics a little bit later about how much early decision can improve your chances. Uh, and sometimes that can, I think, outweigh some of the drawbacks of early decision. So here's some sample timelines. Note these dates are early, so you really need to kind of begin your senior year ready to roll. Uh, you know, you need to have your SATs completed, SAT or ACT completed. Typically by the um, October exam would be about the last time that you can get those scores in. Uh, some places November, but typically the October exam. And deadlines are often around November 1st, sometimes a little bit later. Uh, but you look on the right-hand column there, the notification date. This is the beauty of early decision. You'll know where you're going to, you know, if, if you get in, you'll know where you're attending before Christmas, which is a, a nice, nice position to be in. All right, early action. So we did ED and here's EA. Early action is a much more generous program. So with early action, get my slides to work here. One second. Okay, there we go. Uh, so early action is non-restrictive, which means that you can apply early to more than one school. Early decision, just one school. Early action, uh, as many schools as you want. Uh, it's non-binding. So this is, this is where it's really different from early decision. So if you're admitted 
under early action, you have until May 1st, just like regular admission, to make your decision. And you're welcome to turn down the early action school if you want to. Uh, you're not beholden to them. There's no deposit you're going to forfeit or anything. Uh, a big perk, just like early decision, is that you get your decision early. We'll look at some dates in just a minute here. And then, like early decision, but maybe not quite as strong a correlation, um, a higher percentage of early action applicants are admitted than regular admission applicants. So it's kind of like priority decision where by applying early and showing that eagerness, um, it really kind of demonstrates your interest in the college and improves your chances of getting in. Uh, and, and bottom line here, there's really no downside to early action other than you need to have all your ducks in a row early on. You have your test scores um, in hand and have your letters of recommendation and have your application essay all ready by that kind of early, often kind of November 1st deadline. All right, uh, here's a variation on that though. And a few select schools use this model. This is called single choice early action. A couple, couple of the Ivy League schools use this model. And here's how this works. So you can apply early, but like early decision to only one college. So with regular early action, you can apply to multiple schools. With single choice, you can only apply to one college early. Uh, like the other models, you'll get your decision early. It's non-binding, just like uh, early action. So you have until May 1st to decide. And like early action and early decision, a higher percentage of applicants tend to be admitted under early action than regular admission. So really the only difference here between single choice early action and early action is that you can apply to only one school early. And I think some colleges do that just to really kind of have you prove to them that that school is your top choice uh, and that you're not you know, sending out applications early to attend 10,000 schools. All right, here's some sample deadlines for early action, very similar to early decision, most of them kind of early November. Look at University of Georgia there though, that's, that's even earlier yet in October. And in general, you'll hear uh, about the decision by December. <coughs> okay, David's asked a good question here, which is what happens if you are rejected under early action or early decision? And it's a good question. If you're often not rejected, what may happen, I mean, you can be rejected. If the school looks at your application and decides you're really just not a match for us, you don't have the credentials to attend here, you may get a rejection letter. But what often happens is your admission gets deferred. And so instead of get being admitted you know, by December 20th or whatever the date is, um, you'll be deferred to the regular applicant pool and you'll hear in the spring. So your application will be kind of pushed into the, the general pool and you'll be kind of you know, evaluated alongside of the general application pool and you'll, you'll learn then whether or not you get in under regular admission. So it's kind of a frustrating limbo to be in, to be deferred like that, but it's also quite common. I actually went to, I went to MIT as an undergraduate and that's exactly what happened to me. I applied early. I was deferred, and by the luck of the gods, I actually got in under regular admission. Uh, and that's it's not that unusual. Um, so, but but realize there are kind of three options here: you can get accepted, rejected, or deferred. And being deferred is actually fairly common. All right, does applying early improve your chances? I've already stated that it does, but let's look at some numbers uh, and and kind of talk through the issue here. So, so. If you ask colleges, you know, does applying under early decision improve my chances? They'll usually say, no. You know, you're you'll be evaluated the same way whether you're in the regular applicant pool or the early decision pool. Um, that we accept a higher number of early decision applicants because those are the stronger applicants. Uh, that's kind of the typical story that you'll hear, and that's not entirely true perhaps. Uh, when you really look at the numbers, a lot higher percentage of students get in under early decision and early action. So I'm not, I'm not fully convinced that your chances are equal. I think if you really know where you want to attend, applying early is your best choice. And 
And there's a reason why colleges like early applicants, and I've listed a few of those reasons here. It shows that you're motivated, that you're committed to the school. It shows that you're organized enough to get your application in early. And, and it also really helps the college figure out what their incoming class looks like earlier on. Uh, you know, the number, the percentage of applicants or, or of admitted students who um, kind of fill the class from that early applicant pool is pretty sizable at some of the, the top schools and they, they really like to kind of lock in their class early. All right, let's look at some data. So these, here's just the Ivy League. Uh, we could do this with other schools as well and you'd, you'd probably see similar numbers. But, uh, and these numbers are from the, the past admission cycle, so the 2013 admission cycle. And these are significant numbers, right? So uh, look at Harvard, for example, right? Overall admit rate of less than 6%, but the early admit rate um, with single choice early action, so that's again the non-restrictive um, you know, admission model, 21%. You know, so ask yourself, which one of those applicant pools would you like to be in? And the overall admit rate is includes the early admit students, so for the regular admission applicant pool, that number is even lower than that. So, so any case, especially if you're applying to really highly selective schools, you know, the Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, um, you know, Vanderbilt, any of, any of those really kind of prestigious schools, uh, applying early really does, I think, improve your chances. You know, assuming you know, especially if it's early decision, you know that's the school for you. All right. Rolling admission, let's totally shift gears here. This is a very different model. So rolling admission, general idea here is that there is no concrete application deadline. So, uh, you know, you can apply whenever. Re review of applications will begin in the fall and it will continue as long as there are spaces available. And, and some schools really this continues right into the summer. Uh, there are students who sometimes are admitted in August and attend class the next week. Uh, I don't recommend that though, right? If you can apply early, clearly do so. Uh, so some more details here. Um, you know, rolling admission doesn't mean you can apply when, or it doesn't mean you should apply whenever because programs can fill. Uh, you know, if you have one a particular major, that could get filled up. The entire class might get filled up, at which point they'll no longer accept applications. And you also want to think about financial aid um, because that can disappear on you as well. You know, the, the college is going to award financial aid while they have it, and when it runs out, um, that's that. So let me just turn to a question here from, from someone. Uh, so, so Adam asks, if you're denied admission during the early admission process, are you able to apply again when the regular admission is going on? Uh, if you're rejected, the answer is no. Uh, you've already been rejected for that year. You can try again the following year, uh, but you've been rejected. Uh, but more often than not, if you're a qualified student, they'll automatically put you into the regular admission pool so you'll be considered with that applicant pool. So that's, that's kind of the more typical scenario. Uh, but if they really think you're not qualified, that they're going to have be able to fill a class with students who are stronger than, than what your application presents, uh, then you can't reapply that same, that same year. It's a good question. Uh, and so back to, back to rolling admission here, once you apply, often you'll have kind of rolling acceptances as well. So the earlier you apply, the earlier you will hear. So again, lots of, lots of perks for applying early. Okay, another question here. Oh, so um, Diane asks, can I apply right now if it's really mission? And, and the answer is no, probably not. Uh, although I wouldn't be surprised if some schools would be happy to take your application now. Typically applications go live um, in late August, early September for the following academic year. Uh, but that, that does vary from school to school. Uh, I mean, there's some schools where you could apply right now for the fall. So schools with rolling admission where you know, if, if you have your high school degree in hand, you could apply to schools now and be admitted for the fall. 
but schools are not yet accepting applications for the fall of, let me get my years right here, 2015. Uh, that'll be a few months down the, down the road here. Okay, and then finally, you know, scholarship and financial ed aid deadlines may be different than the application deadline. So even though the school has rolling admissions, uh, you might need to apply by a certain date in order to qualify for scholarships and financial aid. And that's, that's typically the case. So again, applying early is better, but realize you know, that often there are still kind of options out there even in the spring. And even you know, at a late date like this, there, there are options for the fall. Okay, open admission. And open admissions is kind of a, a misleading term. So in its purest form, it means that any student with a high school diploma can attend. And you know, community colleges have, in general, have open admission. So if, if you want to attend community college and you have your high school diploma, you can do so. Um, that said, it's not quite that simple. Some colleges with open admissions um, will admit every student assuming they meet a kind of minimum threshold. Like they might need a certain GPA, they might need certain SAT scores, they might need to have a certain balance of classes from high school to show they're college ready. And if you meet those criteria, then you have guaranteed admission. Uh, but that doesn't mean everyone gets in. You have to kind of meet, meet those criteria. And another issue with this is that, uh, I think I have one more, one more bullet here. Um, even if it's open admission, that doesn't mean that classes won't fill up and programs fill up. So, so you may you know, be guaranteed to attend that community college, but when you go to enroll, you find that the classes you want are full. And that can, can very well happen. So, so again, just because it's open admission, try to act early to guarantee your spot and, and you know, make sure you kind of meet those minimum criteria. All right. Moving on here, let's look at a couple of case studies. So just kind of samples of, of situations that you might find yourself in as you go through the admission process. So, so here's John, and John has done his research, he visited campuses, and he really knows that he wants to go to Cornell, right? This is his top choice school, uh, and you know his, his heart is set on it, and he, it's his big dream. So in his situation, um, he should apply early decision to Cornell because he knows this is where he wants to go. If we went back to that chart and looked at those stats, in fact, let me, uh, let me do that here. So right here's the Ivy League and here is Cornell, right? Um, and if we look at those, let me underline this here, these numbers, oops, we see, oops, my line's crooked. Uh, let me erase that that 14% right, of regular applicants get in, twice that number get in under early decision. John would be much better applying under early decision. So, and then he can still apply regular decision to other schools. All right, before we go into the next slide, let me, uh, Dan has another, another question here. So what if you have a high GPA and low ACT score, will you be admitted? For, for a lot of, for those schools that tend to have that kind of minimum requirement, often you'd be fine. Because often the, the, the criteria will say something like, you know, you need to have a 2.5 GPA or a, you know, 1000 or something on the, on the SAT or whatever the number might be. Um, and it's, it's or, so you need one or the other. So you need some, you know, some measure that is above that bar to kind of get into a school with, with open admission, with that kind of, um, those kinds of guidelines. All right, so let's look at another case study here. Number two, so Jane. Jane has visited several schools and she loves three of them. So she likes the University of Chicago, she likes Georgetown, and she likes Northwestern. All very selective, difficult to get into schools. So, so Jane's got a bit of an issue here because, you know, she hasn't, doesn't have one clear top choice. So what do we recommend for Jane? Uh, so University of Chicago and Georgetown both have early action programs. And if you recall, 
Early action is non-restrictive. You can apply to more than one school under early action, and early action will typically improve your chances of being admitted. So she should apply to both of those schools under early action. And then with Northwestern, she should apply regular decision because Northwestern has that evil restrictive early decision plan where she can only apply to one school. So in this case, she's getting early applications off to sc two schools, still applying to Northwestern, and kind of maximizing her chances of getting into at least one of those schools. All right, another case study. So Raquel has identified several interesting schools in the Northeast, but hasn't been able to visit them and doesn't have strong feelings about a specific school. So, and this is, this is not unusual, right? She just doesn't quite know where she wants to go. She kind of knows the geographic area, uh, but nothing's really jumping out for her. So here's her plan. Um, you know, apply early action whenever she can, because that does nothing but help your chances. Uh, and you also might get decisions early. And then for all the other schools, apply regular admission. Uh, but again, apply early when you can, right? Uh, because the earlier you get those applications in, often the sooner you'll hear from schools, the sooner you might be able to um, learn about financial aid. And, and also you might have a better chance at getting merit-based scholarships uh, by applying early. So she is not someone who should ever apply early decision because she's clearly indecisive about where she wants to attend. So she does not want any kind of binding uh, contract here. All right, and case study four, and in my, my work writing for about.com, I always, every year I get very sad and panicked email messages from applicants who, who find themselves in this situation. So. So Brian applied early decision to his top choice school and regular decision to four other colleges. He was rejected or waitlisted by all of them. And this is a very unenviable position to be in, but unfortunately it does happen. You know, Brian is probably someone who kind of overestimated his competitiveness at these schools and you know schools that he thought were maybe a safety school were actually more of a match school and, and the kind of cards weren't in his favor here. So, anyway, so here's Brian and it's April and he's got no choices, right? Maybe he'll get into one of those waitlisted schools, but he doesn't know, he won't know until May. Uh, so he's, he's really kind of in a bind here. Uh, but realize this isn't the end of the road and here's what he can do. Okay, so plan A, he can take, just take a year off. He could do a gap year and then reapply the following year. If he does a really interesting gap year, that might even make him into a kind of more interesting and competitive candidate. Uh, and he'll also you know, have, have a year of maturity, which is always a good thing. Uh, he can also, you know, if he hears about all this in April, there's still time to apply to uh, colleges that have rolling admissions. Some of them will still have openings, so he'll still have some options out there. And then finally, and this just came out a couple weeks ago, he can check the, this is NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. Um, every May, they publish a list of schools that still have openings. Uh, they just renamed it this year. It used to be called the Space Availability Survey. It's now called the College Opening Update. And this year, when it first came out, it had about 250 schools on it. And now I think it has over 400 colleges on it. Um, those are colleges that did not meet their enrollment quotas that they wanted to, so they still have spaces, and they will still take applications even at this late date. So, um, so there's still options, and there's some very good schools in that list. You're, you're not going to find the Ivy League schools or your Amherst and Pomona's on that list, but you will find kind of very high quality four-year colleges. Uh, with our kind of regular admission program that actually will still take applications late. So it's not the end of the world even when things go wrong and Brian could very well get into a, a great college and uh, be all set when the fall rolls around. All right, let me see, we got some more questions here. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, did 
So Mimi's asking about, um, this is kind of along the lines of choosing a college. Uh, so she's interested in marine biology as a major. One of her favorite schools has that program, but only as a minor. So what do you do? And that's, that's a tough situation to be in, right? Where you love this particular school, but the school doesn't have the exact program that you want. With something like marine biology, you could you know, talk to the faculty there and see what their, actually bi their biology program has to offer because you might be able to do kind of biology with a marine concentration or something uh, to kind of fulfill that, you know, your, your interest there. Uh, but it is true, if you're interested in a particular program, you'll really want to kind of see what schools are strong in that particular area. Uh, you know, in general, if you're applying to kind of comprehensive uh, universities and liberal arts colleges, they're really going to offer a, a, a full breadth of, of different majors and chances are you'll, you'll find something that, that really kind of suits your, your interests. All right, uh, so that brings us to the end of the final case study here. And at this point, I'm happy to just open up the floor to questions. Uh, and I've, I've put my contact information here as well. So my, feel free to email me if, you, you know, if a question comes up later on or, or if you're watching this, um, this presentation uh, in the rec recorded form, feel free to email me. I've also put down the URL of my college admissions website. And again, that website has all kinds of information about the application process, you know, what SAT and ACT scores you're likely to need, uh, how to write a winning college admissions essay. I've got tips for all of the essay options on the common application, um, tips for college interviews, uh, profiles of schools. So, so anyway, all of that's available on that site. And I've also put up there, of course, my university website because uh, I'm a, I've been teaching at Alfred University for, a, for 17 years and it's a, a, a great little place here in Western New York. So I hope you'll come and check that out as well. All right, so let's see, we got some questions. Um, Mimi, yes, where, where can we get this recording? It's, I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know when they put it up, but it, it will be archived on the College Week Live website uh, for a while. So you can check back a little later and it should be there. Um, actually, uh, someone's telling me it's, it's on demand right away. So, so um, you know, go to the, the main page there and you should be able to hunt it down and, and, and find it. Uh, Carlos asks a question. Uh, how many colleges should I apply to? <laughs> and that's, that's the million dollar question. You know, I gave you that example of poor Brian here, right, who applied to five schools and got into none of them. <laughs> so you, you, the takeaway from that seems to be, well, maybe he should have applied to more than five. But it really kind of depends on what types of schools you're applying to and you know, really kind of how likely you are to be admitted. Uh, you know, if you're applying to things like the Ivy League schools and those, what some people call the lottery schools, where it's, you know, the acceptance rate is 10, 15 percent or, or even less, uh, you're, you're going to want to apply to quite a few schools because your chances are pretty low. But if you've really kind of matched yourself well with different colleges and, and are, are pretty assured of getting into a few of the schools in your list, you know, I often recommend applying to six or seven schools, you know, you know, maybe two or three reach schools and a few schools that are kind of, you know, uh, a good match for your credentials. And then a couple of schools that, you know, you'd still be happy to attend, but that you're pretty, pretty assuredly going to get into. Uh, but you'll see different advice on that. I, I've certainly heard people say, you know, apply to 10 or 12 schools just to maximize your chances uh, because it's so competitive. The common application makes it fairly easy to uh, apply to multiple schools. But, you know, my, my biggest advice is, is only apply to schools where you really want to attend. I, I see a lot of students who apply, you just kind of blanket the market with applications. And, and the reality is they really w wouldn't want to attend half of those schools. And that's just kind of wasting application money. It's wasting your time and it's wasting the college's time as well. So. Uh, anyway, you know, I, again, I recommend kind of in that six, seven, eight schools, but you know more if if they're kind of a reach for your for your credentials. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so Grace has asked, um, when should I take the SAT? And that's a 
A very good question. Anyone take it this May? I know scores were released today. Uh, it's a busy day on the SAT front. Um, and in general, for regular admission, you can take the SAT safely up until November of your senior year. And, and with many schools, even the December test will still get the scores uh, in on time to meet the application deadline. Uh, for early admission, you know, early, early um, decision and early action, typically the October exam is going to be your last option. So uh, that tends to be actually a very popular test date. Uh, but you, want, you do want to make sure you, you plan ahead so that you can have those test scores in hand in time and check with the schools you're applying to to really see what the last deadline is. All right, um, so Ben is asking about, I mentioned this a little bit earlier with early decision, does early decision hurt my financial aid chances? And that's, that's another kind of tough question. So if, if you remember, early decision is restrictive, right? So you apply to that one school. If you're admitted, you have to withdraw all your other applications and you're committed to attend that school. And that means that you're also kind of locked in to the financial aid package that that school offers you. And I've heard people worry that, well, that means that they're not going to offer me much financial aid because they know I have to attend there, so I'm trapped and they're, they're going to, you know, um, kind of rake me over the coals with, with a lousy financial aid package. The reality I've found isn't that. Uh, more often than not, those early decision students who are ad admitted are students the college really wants to attend and they're eager to have you there and they're typically going to going to offer you a good financial aid package um, so and and then also the uh, kind of financial reasons are, are one reason you can back out of an early decision contract if the school is not able to meet your kind of demonstrated need um, you can often then get out of that contract. So, so typically, I've found that early decision students do get fair financial aid packages. What you don't have is the ability to compare financial aid packages. So in that sense, you lose out a little bit. Uh, and there may, may have been some other school that would have offered you a great merit aid, you know, you know merit-based scholarship that you're not getting at your early decision school. So, so it does limit you, but I wouldn't worry about them trying to kind of take advantage of the fact that you applied early decision. You're, you're their best applicants. You're the most eager students. You've shown the most demonstrated interest. Um, they're, they're gonna try to treat you as well as they can. So, so, so keep that in mind. I don't think financial aid is a reason to not apply early decision. All right. Any other questions? Okay, let's see here. So Adam has a question. Uh, should you spend more time on the admissions application for Ivy League schools in order to make it more competitive than spend an adequate amount of time on the rest of the colleges? Uh, it's a good question. So if you're using the common application, which all of the Ivy League schools use, then you know that that question is is kind of moot for that part of the application. So your 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 basic essay is going to be the same essay for all of those schools. Uh, but most of the Ivy League schools and most of the highly selective schools have supplements to the common application that are specific to that school. Uh, they may ask you another essay question. They may say, you know, why do you want to attend Brown University? And you do want to put a lot of time into those responses and you want to make them unique to the school that's asking the question. Show them that you've done the research, show them that you really do want to attend that college in particular, not just a generic college. Uh, so so my, my answer is yes. I mean, I think really every application to a highly selective school, you should put a lot of time and care into it and it really needs to demonstrate that you want to go to that school. Uh, and those essays really do matter. You know, the, especially for the, you mentioned the, the Ivy League schools, Adam, you know, those are schools with acceptance rates that range from, you know, 6% to 15%. And 
most of the applicants are straight A students. Most of the applicants have stellar SAT and ACT scores. So what's going to make you stand out? Uh, the other things, you know, really interesting extracurricular involvement uh, and your essay. And having a really well-crafted, personalized essay is, uh, is, is going to be important. It's a, big, it's a big piece of the equation. And, um, and I'd say particularly at those top schools. Okay, so let me see if we got any more questions here. Um, so Bridge is asking the, kind of the opposite question. I've, I've said, you know, mail your applications in early, and Bridget's asking what happens if you kind of mail them right on the deadline? Does that hurt your chances? And I think the colleges would say, you know, no, we give everyone kind of a fair evaluation, but, but realize I think the majority of students out there are procrastinators. Uh, I know I'm one. The majority of applications come in close to the deadline, and you're just better off if you're not in that big pile of mail. You know, if you send it in early, they can read it more carefully. It, it shows you know that you're organized. Uh, so, so my my sense is that actually waiting until the deadline to mail in your application. Um, isn't working in your favor. It may not hurt you, but but there's a chance it could. Um, my recommendation is to not do that if you can avoid it. Okay, uh, one other question. Uh, Julie asked, when should I ask for letters of recommendation? Another good question. And you know, when you're applying to colleges, keep track of all the pieces of the application because you know, there's the stuff that you can fill in. There's the essay, there's your test scores, all that kind of stuff that you can fill in. But uh, letters of recommendation, that depends on somebody else who is doing you the favor of writing that letter. And you don't want to uh, come up to that person the day before the application is due and say, hey, could you write this letter of recommendation for me? I need it by tomorrow. All right, that's one, just really rude. And chances are the person's going to say, no, I can't, I can't do it that quickly. So plan ahead, especially if you're applying early action, early decision. You know, whoever's writing that letter, if it's a teacher or your guidance counselor, ask them as soon as you're back in school in the fall, uh, maybe even ask them earlier uh, in the summer if, if, if you have their contact information uh, to give them a good, you know, good leeway on, on writing you a, a thoughtful letter of recommendation. All right, any more, any more questions before we sign off for the for the session here so all right one more question here uh, so Adam writes my school is pretty small graduating class of 30 that that is small um, will Ivy League schools judge or take less interest in my application since I didn't graduate from a school with a larger student population also my school doesn't offer AP honors or, or dual credit classes will that be detrimental to my admissions and that's, that's another kind of tough question. Um, colleges definitely take into consideration the, what school you attended. You know, some schools are known to have really rigorous academic programs with, like you're saying, lots of AP or IB or honors classes and, you know, and, and those dual, dual degree programs. Um, and they're known to really prepare students well for college. There are other high schools that don't do nearly as good of a job. And that's, that's all part of the metrics they use when they evaluate students. So coming from a small school that doesn't have those offerings, you know, one, realize they're not going to penalize you for not taking courses that weren't offered. Um, they want to see that students take the most challenging curriculum available to them. And in your case, you don't have a whole lot available to you. Uh, at the same time, they do want to see, you know, a, a kind of real demonstration that you are prepared for college. You know, if you have an option of, for example, taking a, a community college class in the in the summer or in the evenings, um, that's one way that you might be able to, you know, kind of get something that would be kind of equivalent to an AP or a dual credit class. Uh, standardized test scores are going to be more important for you than for other applicants because 
you know, there's, they're not going to have a whole lot to compare you with um, based on your coursework, given the size of your school and the, the lack of APs. Um, but those SAT and ACT scores, that they, they can measure you against the best students from the best school. So those are going to have probably more weight in your, in your situation. And, and also realize there are some options to take AP courses online. So even if your school doesn't offer them, uh, look around because there, there, there are ways you can still kind of take an AP course and, and get those and, and then take the AP exam and get those credentials even if your school doesn't offer that. Um, you know, it's going to cost money, which may or may not be a, a problem for you, but, but realize there are some options out there for getting AP credit despite the fact that you go to a really small school. All right, that's, I think that's all of our questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining me here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the day at the uh, May event here at College Week Live. And we'll uh, hopefully see you, you know, drop, drop by my about.com site and say hi, and, uh, and best wishes with the end of your academic year and with your college applications. All right, take care.